Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who are joining us for the evening session of the Israel Social Cohesion Summit 2021. I'm so excited to have all of you from around the world join us in Yerushalayim, in ADL Israel's moving studio located in front of the Knesset. Welcome to ADL Israel Social Cohesion Summit. My name is Carol Doriel and I'm the director of ADL in Israel. This is the fourth summit we convene to touch upon some of the most pressing issues within the Israeli society. We will soon hear from our distinguished panelists and will be joined by Minister of Diaspora Affairs Omer Yankelevich and Chairman of the Jewish Agency, Mr. Isaac Herzog, both very good friends of ADL. But before that, we're joined live through Zoom by ADL CEO and National Director, Mr. Jonathan Greenblatt, who will give some opening remarks. Shalom, Jonathan, good evening, please. I believe today's summit really showcased the wonderfully diverse makeup of Israeli society. And Israel is an amazing place and ADL is so proud to provide the Social Cohesion Summit as an annual platform that celebrates and explores the richness of Israel's diverse society. As an American Jew with a deep connection to Israel, I have observed over the past year how the global coronavirus pandemic has unfortunately brought out some deep divisions within our two societies. Here in America, an abundance of conspiracy theories, anti-Semitic, anti-Asian, and otherwise, have arisen in response to the pandemic, which has led to some very disturbing and tragic results, including the January 6th storming of the U.S. Capitol. In Israel, we've seen significant tensions between the Haredi community and Israeli more secular society over the rules and regulations governing the COVID-19 response, including some violent and really unfortunate protests. Wherever one looks around the world, there are indeed signs of fractures and growing divides among different societies, something that I find to be a very worrying trend, which has the potential to negatively affect democracies and really upend the sort of liberal order, the values of tolerance and pluralism that for so long have guided our societies. Yet we've also seen some significant bright spots emerge during the past year. And let's talk about that for a moment, because we've seen some really inspiring moments both in Israel and America. For example, Israel has gone from being the startup nation to the vaccination nation. It's shown extraordinary results vaccinating all segments of its population and even using creative and innovative grassroots efforts to get people vaccines, such as administering shots at bars or offering free pizza or a bowl of cholin to the people who would get vaccinated, although I don't think at the same time. Even the prime minister himself has become a media celebrity. His commercial encouraging people to, to do vaccinations literally I think he might um, consider a post-political career in Hollywood, if, if you will. In the U.S., the vaccine rollout has been much less streamlined, to be honest. But individuals and organizations have worked to navigate the complex appointment process to assist seniors and at-risk people and others who've been having trouble making appointments. And the work of our frontline responders here in America has been brave and heroic and worth celebrating. Ultimately, I think both our societies understand that despite internal differences, we especially now in this moment need to focus on the commonalities and work together to prevent further fracturing. And the same goes for the relationship more broadly between diaspora Jewry and Israel. We undoubtedly have many differences. The recent Israeli Supreme Court ruling recognizing reform and conservative conversions conducted in Israel I think that reflects this divide. The ruling was welcomed by and large in the American Jewish community, including in elements of the Orthodox world, and in organizations like ADL. We think it was an incredibly important decision. In Israel, however, I know the reaction was quite different, with significant criticisms coming from important voices in the religious and Haredi communities, including some leading politicians and even the chief rabbis with some, unfortunately, resorting to hateful attacks on reform and conservative communities. And I would just say, like, demeaning fellow Jews because of, you know, how they daven, right? Or how they're, it's just in completely inappropriate, it's out of line, and it's beyond the pale, which is why we've spoken out against it clearly and will continue to do so. 
But despite the but despite that situation and the differences between our two communities, I think again we share so much. The diaspora community is overwhelmingly Zionist. Their connection to Israel is an individual element of their Jewish identity. And we exhibit a concern and love for Israel, even when we criticize it. We both care deeply about the safety and well-being of Jews around the world, whether a Jewish person is attacked in Brooklyn or B'nai B'rak, whether it's in Paris or Poway, Tel Aviv or Tehran. We know the underlying anti-Semitism, the oldest hatred in the world, is a virus we all must fight, no matter where we live or how we pray. And I will tell you, we still have a lot of work to do to continue to bridge the divides and address the underlying tensions. And as an American Jewish leader, I've got to say how, how appreciative I am to have such committed Israeli partners, including Diaspora Minister Yankelevich and Chairman of the Jewish Agency, Buji Herzog, both of whom have demonstrated, I would say, a real sincere commitment to understanding the nature of our American Jewish community and its needs. If we're serious about addressing the religious, political, and societal challenges that divide us, we need leaders like Minister Yankelevich and Buji to step up and work together with Diaspora Jewelry, and they've already taken some important first steps. Thank you again to all of you who joined us for today's conference. I hope you and your families are healthy and safe. And if you're not already vaccinated, I hope it happens soon. And I do look forward to being able to see all of you in person soon. So, to Daraba and Litrot. I'd like now to pass on the mic to David Horvitz, founding editor of the Times of Israel, who will interview Minister of Diaspora Affairs, Omer Yankilevich. It's a pleasure that, uh, to have you on this, uh, in this uh, session. And really, um, you focused a lot of attention on trying to create a kind of formal um, framework for dialogue between Israel and the diaspora. Uh, you've been pushing legislation to require consultation on Israel diaspora issues. Can you tell us what, what the goal of this legislation is and where it stands now? Okay, let's start to speak a little bit about the legislation, a little bit about peoplehood, because I see that we have a little bit uh, uh, problems with the line. So I will tell you that today the Jewish people face both uh, great ongoing challenges and opportunities, but I believe that now during this uh, particularly difficult period, where uh, all of us uh, across the Jewish world are struggling, we have been able to come together and use our energy and imagination to create new opportunities between us. Uh, there, is a, there is a new conversation taking place in the Jewish world around creating a mutual conversation and relationship between Israel and world Jewry. Uh, there is a hunger, uh, of connection, to build a new dialogue on what uh, unites us rather than what divides us, uh, only from uh, understanding how we are uh, how we are connected as a, as a people, can we solve challenges facing the Jewish world from, uh, you know, from Jewish education to, to combat anti-Semitism. So in response to, to this feeling, uh, the ministry, uh, the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs, my staff, uh, we are focused right now on stand standardizing a consultation, as you asked me, a consultation process uh, between the State of Israel and World Jewry. Uh, on matters, I have to, to be uh, exact, on matters regarding world jury. Uh, this is uh, one of the most uh, exciting uh, initiatives taking place in our office and represent a, a real paradigm shift in the relationship between, between Israel and the world jury. And the idea is grounded in, in an understanding of the importance of a mutual mutual dialogue between Israel and world Jewry, between the government, between the citizen. It represents the, the state of, uh, of Israel, of the government of Israel, taking responsibility 
for its side of the relationship. In the end, it's cooperations and it's, we have two sides and this is the responsibility that we have to take. And acknowledging that uh, decisions made within our government directly impact Jewish communities around the world. Thank you for being with us. And I'm gonna turn now um, immediately to the gentleman sitting next to me, uh, the chairman of the Jewish agency, my friend. Buji Herzog, hi, hi, hi how are you? Fine, good so, to see you and Carol too. Good thank to you for you. joining us. Um, thank you. Let's talk about, uh, it's been a year of COVID. No, first of all, I want to relate to what the minister Please, said. Please, by all means. Because there is, of course, a legislated and operational mechanism of consultation between uh, Israel and the world jury. And that is through the national institutions, through the Jewish agency, mm -hmm. which I lead, the world's biggest Jewish organization. Uh, there is a law, there is a covenant, and the leadership of the Jewish world is represented. Uh, and the, through the World Zionist Organization, all facets of Judaism are represented. So I believe that uh, we are the pillar, and in the original bill, which was presented by Tehila Friedman, who is going to follow me right, in the she'll interview, be with us soon, sure. it is said clearly that the Jewish agency is the pillar, and I hope that will be the right ne mechanism. I don't see any other possible mechanism. Just, um, okay, fine. The, the, the past year has been, you know, it's been a terrible year for, for humankind grappling with a pandemic. Um, in, in your work and, and what the agency uh, has, dealing with, what, what has been dealing with, what do you see as the implications of the pandemic for diaspora jury? And, you know, do you see it as having sparked greater anti-Semitism? Do you see it as, as having likely triggered greater, greater Aliyah? What's, how is the, the world, uh, uh, world jury grappling with the pandemic in those okay, contexts? Okay, look, we are a nation of 15 million human beings in uh, a sea of seven and yeah. yeah, in a sea of seven and a half billion. We're tiny, mm -hmm. and yet we're so impactful and so great as a nation. Uh, and clearly this uh, a pandemic, which is a worldwide phenomena, has impacted world jewelry dramatically, meaning there are many communities who literally froze or cracked or broke apart. And we, the Jewish Agency, through the mechanism of a special loan fund, where together with partners such as the Jewish Federations of North America and Karen Isod, we literally saved communities all over the world, dozens and dozens of them, enabling the economic model to sustain itself because the problem starts mostly with a private school in a community. If the community is older or smaller, it's very difficult to keep the Jewish school. And that was first and foremost the main objective of many of the institutions to hold the fort. Very complicated and something to think about for the future. Secondly, we um, see a huge interest in Aliyah. We brought over in 2020, in the COVID year, 21,000 Jews and more from dozens of countries, meaning there was enormous interest. Imagine no travel, right. limitations, quarantine and all. Over 20,000 people. From, we from, see from countries where there, where there hadn't all been much other the world. different sort of. From, by the way, a lot of countries who are kind of, uh, um, you know, strong countries, mm -hmm. Western countries, uh, from all over the world. By the way, in the United States, we see a tripling demand for Aliyah. Wow. And uh, we see great interest. Because of economics, because of Zionism, because of. Well, it's a fascinating phenomenon. You know, Aliyah has many, many reasons to it. But in this era, in my mind, people sat in, at, in lockdown at home with their families, started thinking, where's our future? Where's the future of our children? What about their education? Plus, the very good name of the State of Israel, the uh, performance when it comes to vaccination, very strong medical system, Good country, despite right. all the complaints. We've complaint, looked good in, all the, in the crisis. We've looked quite good. good. Very good. Right. Uh, all over the world, and that was impressive. And add to it voices of anti-Semitism, which scare people. Anti-Semitism on the web, which has grown dramatically. A report of the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs recently showed million publications of anti-Semitic rhetoric only in English in the last year, meaning 
dramatic stuff is going on and there are changes and shakes and mind boggles people and they say to themselves you know what even in the fact that there is unemployment in Israel we'll give it a chance that that's where you saw the biggest growth in anti-semitism online or whether yeah. Of, yeah we see growth of anti-semitism online but we do project and that is why I want to commend the ADL I want to commend its leadership worldwide Jonathan Greenbel to my good friend and of course uh, Carol who's doing terrific work in Israel I for for putting this topic on the agenda right. because we foresee following the exit from covid we foresee also unfortunately physical possible physical attacks why and why do you why do you see that as a greater threat because people now have limitations of I movement see. So if you've so got people who the, the web and the hatred may, has grown, but they haven't been able to they, go out and do terrible they things. They may translate it. I they see. may transform it. They mm. may do something. And we've seen events. Look, there was a lot of desecration of synagogues right. all over the world, swastikas and all. Yeah. And we we are unfortunately see rhetoric every day. Let me ask you. Um, you know, we're we're trying. This is a, a conference about cohesion between Israel and the diaspora. You're at the heart of that. But there is a certain there's there's greater intolerance within Israel for Jews, I would say, than than in, in many other places well, of the world. Where, well, I would I'm talking be about careful in such well, a remark. You we know we that. can be very nasty to each other, and we can we be nasty love to about. We quarrel. We are a nation that has quarrelled always it's, or it's more argued. Than that. It's more than that. How do we how do we build a, a warmer and more a tolerant relationship amid all the streams of Judaism, and I say that sitting so that's in, a different in Jerusalem. Question. But that's the point that I'm making: the intolerance for different streams of Judaism, where Israel is needs to be part of the solution okay. rather than the problem. So first, let's put things in perspective. I don't negate the fact that there is a lot of tension in Israel. Israeli society has always been tense on an abundance of issues. We are a complicated nation. <laughs> Clearly, a nation state of a nation which is a religion and civilization is a complex challenge. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, um, I can say that there have been chapters in our history where there was arguments and a whole bunch of issues, include state and religion, which were even worse times than what people see today. Now, there is an ongoing tension between various facets of Judaism in Israel, and I believe the only way is a dialogue. The only way is to bring people into a room and have a dialogue. I've been working on this for the last three years endlessly since I assumed office. I go to the most polarized rabbis and leaders of the Jewish uh, streams and groups, and I find that in close quarters, people are much more open to, to each other, and they all admit, yes, they are my brothers and sisters, but now I think there's a lot of politics behind it. People in, in election years, it's very difficult to put hot potatoes on the table because they become politicized. So, you know, the issue of conversion, it came about now during the elections. I'm not really sure if it was the right timing on behalf of the Supreme Court. I think it's an important decision which was uh, waiting for a long time to be uh, decided upon, an issue which is really important but affects a few dozen people only in Israel and that's it because worldwide jury their conversion is recognized in Israel sure so for it's the, the sake it's of the, the symbolism of course of course so I all I'm saying is that these are all issues that are very important but there's an ongoing movement evolution of dialogue for example in my mind uh, the appearance of Rabbi Eliezer Melamed from Har Barcha, a very well-known huge Rabbi in Zionist Orthodoxy or Modern Orthodoxy in Israel, who has, who has appeared together in Makorishon conference with Rabbi Ervin uh, uh, Delphine Horviller from Paris, a Reform Rabbi, was an important step of showing a dialogue because in the United States everybody is together in conferences and sure. meetings. In Israel, they don't really move into that process. They will have to relax understand that we all drink from the same fountain of the origins of our fathers and we have to think how we move from here and and final question with israel at the heart of of the of the global jewish nation that's the role we have to play isn't absolutely it? israel is the nation state of the jewish people and has a duty for entire the entire jewish world so let me tell you first of all on the israeli side most israelis have no clue they don't know enough at times they're ignorant, they don't understand world jewelry and its complexity, its challenges. So we've introduced a program of Jewish peoplehood, 
We work very closely with the Ministry of Education. We uh, educate Israeli children, and we have all our emissaries who come from serving communities over in 66 countries who are now ambassadors within the, the State of Israel. As for world jewelry, they don't either know enough. They don't. They sometimes read the Times of Israel or, or Ynet or anything so. else or uh, all other publications, but they don't really get the evolutionary step where Israel is right now as a nation, as a society. So it's difficult for them to understand Israeli traditionalism. The Israeli, I would say, overlap between secularism and orthodoxy and things like that. And therefore, the perception of life in these two communities is different. It's our duty to make sure in our generation that there's no split between uh, uh, the, what I call Jerusalem and Babylon, six and a half million Jews in Israel and six and a half million Jews in North America. And it's difficult, but it's possible. Isaac Bougie Herzog, Chairman of Thank the Jewish Agency. Much. Thank you. That, that Thank you. Underlining the imperative for dialogue. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Carol, you back to you. Thank you, Minister Yankelevich and Mr. Herzog, for your important messages. And now we're moving to a panel moderated by the indefatigable David Horvitz with voices from Israel who are here in our studio, as well as participants from around the world joining us through Zoom. David, Bevakasha. Thank you, Carol. So we have five panelists. I'm going to say this very quickly because we're going to try and do this fairly quickly. Next to me is Knesset member Tehila Friedman. To her right is um, Israeli researcher, journalist, lecturer, Ben Droyermini. And in different parts of the world, in the distance yeah, there, yeah. Um, is Shira Ruderman, who I think is in Boston. Uh, Binny Goodman, who's the president of the European Union of Jewish Students, who I think is in Brussels. And Rabbi Alejandro Avruj, who I hope is in Buenos Aires. I hope you can hear me. Uh, just in case you can't, we'll start with a, a question in our little mobile studio. And I'll start with you, Knesset member. You gave this incredibly passionate opening speech in the Knesset last summer, um, really lamenting internal Jewish hatreds. Uh, I want to ask you what, you what you consider to be the, the key challenges facing the Jewish nation, the Jewish people around the world, and your ways of grappling with them. Um, we sit here in Jerusalem, so our history tells us that uh, the biggest enemy of us is as a zealotary. You, you frame it as Jewish hatred, I call it zealotary, kana'ut, uh -huh. means... Um, Jealousies? Zealotary. Zealotries. Zealotries. Okay, good. Um, and it's okay for every society to have radicals. It's horrible when radicals takes over and takes leadership. And I feel that lately what we're seeing is first a, a horrible tension between the different groups within the Israeli society and the Jewish people. And, and also um, feeling that radical voices are taking over, even if the vast majority is much more moderate and doesn't, uh, um, doesn't necessarily agree with those messages. The language we hear, the, the visions we see all the time is, you know, they are the enemies. The people that I don't agree with turn to be the enemy. And we see it all over. Just this week with those campaign, you know, blaming reformed Jews to be, you know, all those nonsense about dogs and bar mitzvah, eh? and, and makes them traitors, kind of. Uh, and and of the uh, you know uh, it's it's f with ultra orthodox is Russian speakers is settlers the leftists the you know they 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 are to blame. So how do we how do we make it better? Um, uh, it's really a lot about leadership. I after my speech, uh, a minister from the Likud came to me and say he said you know till it was very nice and mm -hmm. and you know moving, but this is not agenda. I said, why not? And he said, agenda for government, agenda is economy, agenda is uh, security. This is not agenda, social cohesiveness. And I said, if the corona taught us one thing, is that this is agenda, because it doesn't matter what is your agenda, if, if your society can function together, and the level of, of trust between different groups is so low, it doesn't matter what's your agenda, you can't move it forward. So a leadership that will make it agenda. Okay, good. So, Ben Dror, I, I, you know, we, we're hearing, we've heard really three, four people now full of good intention, wanting to, to, to build a, a cohesive Jewish world, 
And here we are outside the Knesset. Um, I'm a cynical journalist for a living. You're, I don't know, an equally cynic. Is this possible? And if so, how do we go, how do we go about doing it? I'm, you know, we're in a country, you mentioned it, in the last few days, a court decision that barely affects anybody directly has unleashed this incredible, bitter, intolerant, uh, I'm not sure mutual, but certainly heavily from one side of the argument. It doesn't seem to me to be in, in the tradition of Orthodox Judaism. I'm with you on that. You know, Derech Eretz Kadam La Torah, I think is the, is the... Can we fix this Israel-Diaspora relationship? Can we produce a more tolerant Jewish world? Um, it is very inter interesting because you are speaking about the Supreme Court decision about the Giyur conversion. Mm -hmm. It is very interesting because if you go to uh, public polls, not among the secular people, but among Orthodox, you find out that most of them, the majority of them, support a real change. They do not want anymore to be forced by the rabbinate and by the ultra-Orthodox, uh, as we call them, Haredim in Israel. I mean, I guess all of us are Zionists, all of us in somehow uh, keep some parts of, of uh, you know, the mitzvot and so on. But, but, when you go to the media, when you go to the Knesset, you find out that, wow, what a polarization. It's not. It's not that bad as it looks like. So the new media and the old media, new media, you know, uh, 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 Facebook, Twitter, and so on. It's not that bad. So even if you go to uh, the Kotel story, that uh, that a lot of people in the United States, whenever uh, I gave lectures, some they asked me, why did the Israeli government change the, right, the, the, the pluralistic compromise. prayer area? Uh, yeah, first of all, yeah. we should stress, I think people think there isn't one. There is no, an area where no, men and women can pray. It, the <laughs> point is, again, if you go to the polls, you find out that most religious people in Israel supported the compromise that was handled by people like Natan Sharansky and others. I mean, so... In, uh, in reality, we are in a much better off than what it looks like from outside. So it's our blame somehow, David, you and I, I mean, bec because we, no, it's not our blame, but politicians, politicians, they are creating this kind of polarization. Social media is creating this kind of, uh, of polarization. We are not there. Now, I don't know how to change it because yes, I'm a kind of, of center Okay, uh, and and there are not so many people like us. Well, let's let's be there and let's David, let's campaign David, for it because the wisdom is between the extremes. We are, we are in the same boat. Yeah. But I have news for you. Yeah, most of the people in Israel and most of the people in the in the diaspora, even if we disagree here, here and there, okay. we are in the same boat. Okay, so Rabbi Avruz, you you're hearing me in Buenos Aires? Yes, perfect. Good. Okay, tell us what the situation is like in Argentina. What is it like for the Jewish community? Uh, as you watch events in Israel as well, how, how are you feeling about this connection? Are we helping you? Are we hindering you? Well, one of the very, very big problems we had here in, in, in Latin America as well, uh, I think, is that uh, uh, we, need, we need that Israel, uh, we need a, a state of Israel to become a, a really, really the, 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 the symbol of a democratic and modern state it is. Why? Because it's, we have no doubt that Israel is the most democratic state in, in the Middle East and the most modern and technological and high-tech uh, state maybe in the world. But in the religious arena, uh, uh, about the modern uh, way of life, uh, it, it's only the, uh, Israel only, uh, on, only has the, the, the orthodox and the radical and the radical way of view. Uh, our religion and our tradition. And in the democratic way of view, uh, Israel is democratic with their Arab citizens, with their Christian believers, with its Muslim believers, but not with all the, uh, the Jewish uh, religion strengths, because uh, the liberal and the conservative and, or the reform uh, uh, families, Jewish families can't live their, real Jewish, their Jewish life uh, safety or in, in freedom. And these kind of, of things impact very strong in our countries here, because when Israel says that only the Orthodox way of life is the kosher way of life, so it, it has a very, very 
negative impact in our countries where, of course, the 80 or 90 percent of the, our Jewish population is non-Orthodox. And, and anyway, it's very hard for, for the families that really, for the hundreds and thousands of families that want to live their Jewishness in a liberal way. Uh, I think that uh, Israel has a very important opportunity uh, to, to, be, uh, to make us feel that we are uh, one people when, with one heart, as we were always with one book, as an example. I, I want to say that uh, in the past, when we were 12 tribes, we were the, 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 the people of the one book. The 12 tribes were in the Torah. When we were the, the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south, Israel and Judah, we were one book, the Tanakh. When we were Abaye and Shammai, he, uh, Hillel and Shammai, Rabbah and Abaye, Babel and Jerusalem, we were one book, the Talmud. When we were Ashkenazim and Sephardim, uh, Moshe Iserles and Yosef Karo, we were one book of Alakha, the Shulchan Aruch. Now we have a very important opportunity. Israel has to become us one book again. The state of Israel is this book. Okay, I want to ask you very quickly, you made some really lovely points there, um, and we're quite short of time. What, what mechanism, you, you may have sensed a difference of opinion between the minister and, uh, and Mr. Herzog about um, what kind of framework we need. What kind of framework would you want for dialogue of this, of this one people between Israel and the diaspora? Very briefly. As an example, I know that most of the people in Israel Inside Israel and the J Jewish uh, world want a democratic and modern state, even in religious affairs. So I think that this is the moment to, to, show, the, to show to all our people that we can be a state, a democratic state for everyone, and to put in, in the arena, in the agenda, these kind of things, to, be, uh, uh, to, to, to accept any, any Jewish way of life inside and outside Israel. Okay, very nice, Binny. If you're still there, just tell me what what kind of interaction would you what would you want with Israel that you don't have at the moment? What kind of mechanism? Uh, can you hear me there, Binny? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, what do you lack? Very briefly. So I think first of all, before we talk about specifics, um, I have the feeling that, that very often um, Europe and Europe's Jewish communities um, are left out of the debate. We have this, these two very big Jewish centers um, in Israel and in the U.S that are shaping Jewish life immensely. And of course, and the size of Jewish communities in Europe and, and around the world, I guess the same might also be true for Argentina and other places around the world, um, are, are nowhere near um, the size of the Jewish community in the US. But I do think, obviously, that, that as a European, that the Jewish life in Europe very often matters. Um, so when I look both at the consultations and for the new consultation mechanism, which I think would be a great step of actually hearing the diaspora and hearing and what we have to say and, and also giving us the chance to shape that debate. Um, but also when it comes to, to other institutions of the state of Israel, very often um, in this debate, Europe is overlooked. Okay. Um, so I think the first Good. step would be to actually be inclusive to Jewish communities that are beyond these two big centers. Well, as, as an ex-Brit, it was a long time ago, but I have a great em empathy with that concern. Yes, very good. Shira, I want to come to you very briefly. You're trying to do stuff. What obstacles w would you like to be moved out of your way that would enable you to do so much more uh, with the, in, in the work that you're trying to do? Wh where, where do you need some assistance clearing up some obstacles, better dialogue? I think that uh, the infrastructure that we are using today are not up to date to the challenges, to the changes in the Jewish community, as we heard, you know, one from Germany, one from Argentina. The Jewish community is not one issue. It's not one voice. So even the consultation, which is a very refreshing idea, has a lot of challenges. How are you going to do it? Who are you going to invite? On what issues are we going to consult with the world jury, with American jury? So before we jump into solutions or platforms, we have to go back to the principle to say, what is it that we are talking about together? What is that we share together? What is it for? I mean, Bougie said we are people of 15 million Jews around the world. It is not just the state of Israel in terms of its citizens. So I, I think we cannot run away from going back to definitions of what is it that we need to work on together because to remove 
a barrier or an obstacle, you have to ask yourself, what, what am I doing it for? And second is, we have to understand that the American Jewish community and the world uh, organizations that represent world Jewry also have to be up to date, meaning they have to make sure that they are diverse and they are inclusive. They have to make sure that they are transparent and democratic because they are not. They are not necessarily choosing their people in a very you know, pluralistic, democratic way. So in order to work together, we have to make sure that we compare ourselves in the same methods to each other. And the last thing I would say, the state of Israel is the state. It's not a community. And as a state, we have to understand what are the barriers that we have, what are the frameworks we have to work together? Where is it we get involved where we do not? Where is it that Israel is responsible to provide support? Where is the time for American jury and the world jury to stand together? And these definitions are very lacking today. And I think this is why we find ourselves walking in circles and talking about very important issues with no solutions. If, uh, thank you, Shira. Ben, draw very quickly. There's a limit to how much Israel wants the diaspora involved in our decisions. I, I think personally the diaspora shouldn't be telling Israel what to do security-wise or diplomacy-wise, but certainly in, in matters that relate to Jewishness, to Jewish life. Yeah. First of all, it's a very good point. I'll tell you why, because many times when I'm asked about the interference of uh, Netanyahu in the politics of the United States, uh, then I'm telling them, you don't want, you don't want uh, us to interfere between Democrats and, and Republicans, between uh, uh, Trump and Biden. So just think the other way around. Do you, want, do you think that we want you to interfere in our politics? No, we don't want. It's not that we do not want to hear you but don't interfere. So, uh, the, just the same way, just the same way, the, you are rightly, rightly against any interference as what happened in the last uh, five, six years of Netanyahu in the American politics. What can, can we do? We can emphasize, we can emphasize the common values, the common interests. There is much more that we have in common than what, no, no, we have a lot in common with most of the Israelis. Uh, I'm not speaking about the government because when the rabbi from Argentina spoke, rightly he spoke about the ultra-Orthodox, but it's not, they do not represent the majority in Israel. Sure. You have to bear in mind that we have much more in common. So many people don't know it. So many people do not know about the Israeli democracy. When I hear, last sentence, when I hear uh, very prominent intellectuals telling their audience, Jewish audience, non-Jewish audience, that Israel, for example, is an apartheid state because 90% uh, uh, of the lands of Israel uh, Arabs cannot buy. It's a lie. You, are, you don't even know that you are lying. Maybe it's not even intentionally, but they are lying. S they do not know so much. I'm just giving you one detail. Yeah. But, but there are so many. We have to know the reality. We have to know the facts. We have so much in common. And we have to, and we have to do a lot in order to know it. Okay, Tila, last word to you, because I think you know. Again, I'm someone who made Aliyah. Um, world Jewry is incredibly invested in Israel. There are there are areas where where Israel rightly does not want the diaspora to intervene. But we are the heart of the Jewish world, and we have a responsibility to be tolerant and and nuanced in the relationship with the Jewish world. Look. I'm an Orthodox woman. For years, we were object for decisions about us without us. All the halachic decisions, we were object to them. I know how, how awful it feels when it's about you without you. So for me, it's not about intervision. It's not about interfering. When we're speaking about conversion, it's or about the Kotel, or about the law of return, I feel that, you know, it's 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 of the Jewish people. It's about as representation, much. right? Yeah, it's it's like no taxation without representation. So I don't think people should <laughs> vote. No, they shouldn't, but they should have a voice because when we are making decisions that have direct impact on them, I'm not talking about all the decisions. Most of the decisions, yes, they ha the impact is mainly on the citizens, and we are the one. To, to make them. I think the metaphors that I'm, I have in mind is like in company, that people who hold stock 
uh, stocks that are people who hold interests. They can become ho stockholders. We, the citizens, we hold the stocks. We, uh, we, hold, uh, we are the shareholders. But they hold interests. They can become citizens if they want. So we should, they should have a voice. Okay. Tila, thank you very much. Thank you to all our panelists. We had a few technical hitches. Mm -hmm. I hope we got through somehow. Back to you, Carol. To Daba and David, in, in a positive spirit, we had a lot of technical um, challenges, but let us take it as a metaphor to Israel diaspora relations. And as we continue the broadcast, in spite of the challenges, let's keep this channel open all the time in spite of the challenges. Yeah, and now moving on to the Q&A session, we have three questions from around the world. So we will start with ADL's national chair, Esta Epstein, joining us live now from Boston. Esta, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Carol, and thank you to everyone who has made this a very, very interesting um, experience in spite of the technical difficulties. Um, for many decades, one issue that is most divided American and Israeli Jews has been religious pluralism and the recognition of non-Orthodox denominations and practices. In the U.S., of course, the majority of the affiliated Jewish community is part of the reform movement. In Israel, the reform and conservative movements exist but seem to be less a part of most Israeli lives, but certainly come up in election campaigns and news headlines. So my question is, do you see anything changing in Israeli society? Is there more of an acceptance of non-Orthodox non denominations and more of an understanding of the American Jewish identity? I guess that's a question for, for you two, maybe. Bendrel, um, is something going to change? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I must admit that I'm going to uh, Orthodox synagogue, I'm going to a reformist synagogue, and I'm going to the conservative uh, synagogue, which is controlled by a rabbi from Argentina, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so something is changing. I mean, Israel of today is not Israel of 10 years ago. Right now, no, right now, uh, all the con congregations, speaking uh, of course mainly about conservatives and reformists, they have much more, uh, how to say it, uh, so presence in the Israeli society, much more than 10 years ago. More and more people are joining the congregations of reformists, and, and I know that the big synagogue in somewhere in North Tel Aviv is, is fully booked. I'm not speaking about the days of Corona. Something is changing. Something is changing. It should, it's a process. It will not happen in one day. It's a process, but I think that I don't know what will be the result of the election, but, but most of the Israelis accept conservatives and reformists, and I think that at the end of the, pro that there will not be end, it's, a, the, it's an ongoing process, but the change is in the good direction. Well, let's just add one, one specific point, which is that there's a reform, the leader of the reform movement in Israel um, seems likely to become a Knesset member. That's you know the first time we have a reform rabbi in the Knesset. Did you want to say something, Taylor? Yeah, I think two good news. Uh, first is you mentioned, and okay. second, uh, it used to be that the religion and state issues were also fight between uh, uh, observant and unobservant in Israel. It's not it's not true anymore. You can see you can see observant people in both sides and and what we call secular people in both sides. Means it's not so much about you know group against group. It's more diverse internally and. This is good news, because I think the challenge for the movements is to find allies in, you know, in other groups in Israel, and not necessarily the acceptance of the of the streams. I don't feel that this is the main issue. Conversion is issue. Shabbat is issue. Marriage is issue. Like that, the thing itself. So even the will, even if there will not be officially acceptance and, and, uh, and status of the streams, I do think we're going to see some steps forward in the right, the right direction. I would like to add, if it's possible, David. Sure. To the answer to Esther. Yes, sure, question. sure. Uh, first, I, I have to say that we have to see the difference between the personal um, experience that people have on the ground versus as a society, as a country. And I'll say on both ends, 
as, as someone that grew up as an Orthodox girl in a mixed house, meaning my father was not religious, my mother was, like Israel is very much like these stories. It is possible to be mixed and it's very acceptance. I think that the change that we see is on society level. There is a greater conversation how we can shape the country a little bit different from pluralistic perspective. And on your other side of your question, um, the Israeli society changed dramatically because we can see in service that we recently did, 70% of the Israeli public is interested in relationship with American uh, Jewish uh, relationship and world Jewry. They are, they are positive about it and believe that the state of Israel should invest in strengthening the relationship. As Joel uh, Yamini said, we did not see that 10 years ago in different service we did meaning that the public is more aware and the conversation is growing and we can feel it on social issues because there is a greater wish for the country to take ownership or at least move away or be more acceptance in certain issues. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Todaraba Shira. We're now joined by uh, Daniel from Colombia. Daniel, good evening. Erev Tov, the floor is yours. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for the time. This is an excellent panel. Um, I wanted to ask a few of the panelists, I don't know who wants to take it. Um, I, it it's related to Beanie's comment earlier that the needs, the religious observance, the Jewish identity of smaller communities is very different than at least the US. So I wanted to see how do you see the role and the future of small Jewish communities throughout the world? Um, I have another question Maybe it's a suggestion based on some of the discussion that you have been having. In the past, I've heard something about a reverse birthright of Israelis going to communities across the world to understand that Jews are seen and perceived as representatives for Israel, even if they are not. So our actions are completely interconnected. So I don't know if that's a program or a plan that, that it's in the works. That was a a question more for Boogie or for the Minister of Diaspora right. Affairs. Maybe some of you might, might have an answer. Thank you. I mean, Bougie made the point that there's a great deal of ignorance uh, in Israel about diaspora jury. Um, it's extraordinarily the case and the need for some kind of reverse birthright. It's been talked about for years. Um, there are certain programs. I mean, think how lost we would be without birthright, by the way, and therefore you get a, a bit of a sense of, of how urgent something going in the other direction as well. Um, maybe um, uh, um, in, from Argentina, uh, Rabbi, maybe you want to weigh in on um, smaller communities around the world and their future. I think it's, uh, yes, it's interesting to say about smaller communities. Uh, of course, we don't have in Latin America the million of Jews uh, in, that we have in, in Israel or in, in the on, in US, in US, but uh, we have in every, every country of Latin America, we have a, a lot of different uh, congregations, most of them liberal, of course, and uh, with thousands and thousands of families, and they are so strong. I can tell you, now in, with the corona uh, uh, a lot of a lot of our congregation make a, an effort, an, an unbelievable effort, and, and now we can say that uh, with all the technological uh, issues and with all the the, the yes, well, the, the, the technological way of of of, uh, of uh, living our new 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 way of congregation now, we we are uh, we are um, we are giving. Jewishness and, and Yiddishkeit and Torah living and Shabbat to every every part of of of, uh, of all over Latin America. Uh, we can say that there are uh, uh, little commu com communities. I don't know. We are talking about thousands and thousands of Jews uh, with uh, hundreds and hundreds of of different synagogues uh, and about uh, what impact has what uh, happened in Israel. Of course, everything. And I can tell you uh, about the last conversation. Of course, that we will not vote in, in political problems of, of Israel, as justice, as a, a limits, as a, anything. But the Jewishness of the Jewish state is a Jewish problem, is a Jewish issue to every Jew. 
כן, קרו? Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Avruj. And now we're moving to a question from Europe. Elisheva is joining us from Germany. Elisheva, please. Hello, uh, I'm Elisheva from Germany. Today, I have the honor to, uh, to represent the Cohesive Students Delegation. We are a group of international students, leader and activist brought together by Anti-Defamation League, European Union of Jewish Students and World Union of Jewish Students to participate in the summit. Um, through the last two days of our program, we found out that Jewish students in Israel and in the diaspora have quite a different understanding of the importance of fighting anti-Semitism. So I would like to ask you how we, but especially you, could strengthen the understanding of such topics between the Jewish communities in the diaspora and in Israel. Okay, that's a great, great big difficult question that you're asking, but Ben Dror seems to be volunteering to answer it, so all yours. <laughs> no, um, yes, I, I'm volunteering to answer because I'm dealing with a question because uh, I have to admit... Did you just write a book? Yeah, I wrote a book about <laughs> what I call, uh, I mean, it's a research uh, industry of lies. I mean, uh, anti-Semitism anti th that you are facing, it's partly because people don't know about Israel, don't know about the realities. What they know is taken from the newspaper and sometimes from uh, academics. And unfortunately, I must admit uh, that I checked it in a very, the deepest way that is possible. And what people know about Israel is not what Israel is. What people know about the Israeli-Arab conflict is not what the Israeli-Arab conflict is. So, so there is a lack of information. It's not that I, I'm not speaking about politics. I'm not, I'm not speaking about views. I'm not speaking about uh, are you in favor of settlements or against settlements. It's not the issue. The issue is about basic questions about Zionism, why uh, Israel is a nation state, something which is not clear to so many people. And when people are ignorant, when they don't know, Sometimes, sometimes they, they develop this kind of views about Israel that in some parts of the society it's becoming against Jews. I mean, uh, we know the propaganda and the campaigns against Jews in the past. We know that right now we have campaigns against the uh, uh, state of the Jews. So, so first of all, we, we, before the media, but we, Jewish students, uh, uh, activists, uh, we have to know the realities in order, in order to know what to answer, in order to know how to react, in order to know how to comment. And there is a huge lack of information. We are trying to bridge the gap. It's not easy, it's not simple. For myself, yes, I'm coming a lot to Brussels in order to give uh, uh, lectures to young students like you. Is it enough? No, it's not enough. What I'm doing is uh, not even a drop in the sea. We need a much, much bigger kind of, of uh, campaign, of, of activities in order to give you the right information, information and then you will be much more, much more confident when you are, uh, uh, when you are uh, uh, facing this kind of problems. If there is still time, I would like to answer as well. Please, Vivekasha. Um, so, so I'll try to be quick. Um, but, I, but I think, and I agree with a lot that, that Dror has just said, but I think that, that some parts are also important to mention because I think part of the question was actually on how Israelis perceive um, our fight against anti-Semitism. And, and it is, of course, true that while Israelis face um, countless threats, um, they do not face anti-Semitism on a daily basis, um, unlike many Jews in the diaspora do. Um, unlike us do, um, and I very often say, we are the generation of young Jews that grew up behind bulletproof glass. We are the generation that is used um, to, to actually having terror drills in our Jewish schools um, after we had fire drills and so on. Um, so I do think that, that, as you mentioned, draw education is key, but I think that education has to go both ways. And because very often um, when it comes to the support from Israel that we absolutely need in the fight against anti-Semitism. Because without the support from Israel, without the security that we have from Israel, we cannot win this fight against anti-Semitism. We cannot continue this fight against anti-Semitism. But I think that it's also important um, to listen to what the diaspora actually experiences and what the issues of anti-Semitism that we are facing are. 
And because, of course, we are facing a lot of Israel-related anti-Semitism, especially on campus. But Israel-related anti-Semitism is by far not the only anti-Semitism that we are facing in the diaspora. I mean, especially in Europe, but I would actually say around the world, we are seeing a growing threat um, from the far right that has started to kill Jews um, in multiple countries. And we are also seeing a threat, of course, um, from Islamist anti-Semitism. I mean, I think it is important that when we talk about these threats, when it comes to fighting anti-Semitism, yes, fighting Israel-related anti-Semitism is extremely important, especially because it often targets young Jews on campus. But actually fighting against the far right, and that also means on a political level, when it comes to which governments, with which political leaders we engage, with which political leaders Israel engages, is absolutely crucial, because this is a kind of anti-Semitism that is also directly threatening our lives. Um, so I think it is important that, that actually the diaspora has a voice and um, because we in the diaspora are unfortunately the experts when it comes to which kinds of anti-Semitism we are facing. Um, so I think that's also important, an important part of the answer. Thank you very much, Bini. And like this, uh, I'd like to thank um, all of our panelists. So Bendo, member of Knesset Tehila Friedman, Bini Gutman, um, Rabbi Avruj and Shira Ruderman, thank you so much. We've heard uh, this evening a wide array of perspective about, perspectives about Israel diaspora relations. And I think that we didn't agree all the time, but what's important is that each and every one of you, and including Minister Yankelevich and um, Chairman of the Sochnut Buji Herzog, and you, David, you're all important assets in building this bridge between diaspora and Israel because you care. And you're also an important asset in strengthening the sense of peoplehood here in Israel and in the diaspora. So thank you um, all very much. Thank you all who joined us from around the world to listen to this important panel. And I hope to see you in person, Bezrat Hashem, in the next Israel Social Cohesion Summit. Good night from Yerushalayim. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.